the creator of style elements <laughs> and working at Cornell yeah. Tech. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for being here, Matt. Thank you for inviting me. That's great. Or accepting my proposal or whatever happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, man, um, so yeah, this, is, this talk is called the Immutable Animators Toolkit, and uh, let's see, can I actually advance my slides? We'll see. Come on, Google. There we go. Um, okay, so yeah, I wrote Style Elements, uh, and then previously I also wrote Elm Style Animation, um, and that's been kind of a ride, basically any... Uh, package with the name style in it. I may or may not have written it. Um, that's not true. Uh, let's see. Here we go. I'm getting used to the controls. So I've been thinking about animation. Um, and this talk is going to be a talk about the thoughts that I've been having about animation um, and kind of an experiment I've been running. And I want to see if you guys think that this uh, approach that I've sort of come up with is interesting. So first off, let's actually look at what animation looks like right now. And this isn't like we're not summarizing absolutely everything, but these are two common packages that people use. And uh, one of them is Elm Style Animation, and the other is Max Goldstein's uh, Elm Animation. And they approach things totally differently. So um, in Elm style animation, uh, you know, we're, we're spring-based, so we want to do like physical animation, and the main concern was like interrupting things, right? So, you know, we, we send part of our UI over there, and it gets like halfway there, and we're like, no, 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 come over here. And we wanted to do that transition nicely mediated by some sort of physics, right? And uh, in Elm animation, uh, it's easing-based, right? And that has a lot of interesting properties as well that we don't have in a spring-based kind of animation set. So uh, I, I kind of say, like, interruptible and, like, not interruptible. And that's not entirely true. Um, there are some things where you can sort of preserve some velocity in, um, in, uh, in Elm animation. Um, but, but it's not built directly into it so that it always is completely consistent. Um, so that's what that comment sort of means. And in Elm style animation, you're essentially storing an animation model for every element you want to animate. And that's fine unless you want to animate like a bunch of stuff, in which case you're doing a lot of talking to your model, hooking everything up to subscriptions, and uh, trying to make it work. In animation, you're still tracking values. So in your model, you have uh, literal like values that you are animating or in the process of animating. So instead of like maybe at the element level, this is at the property level, sort of. Um, in Elm style animation, we have high-level keyframes, which is nice. That means we can sort of uh, set, oh, we want to be here, and then all of these properties, we, we want to be over here on this keyframe, and sort of make that happen on the same timetable. And in Elm animation, it's really easy to time travel because you're just dealing with the math of actually, you know, interpolating all these things. So it's not too hard to actually just declare a new time interval that looks at a different thing. And we can't really get that in Elm style animation because we're just tracking your, your physical components, right? We're, we're tracking the, the physical part of it. So great. So we have kind of what's going on here. So. Uh, the main thing I'm going to be looking at is this whole thing that each of these are storing things in your model and getting really interested in what do we need to store in your model to actually animate things nicely. So let's uh, design a new animation library, huh? Um, so I was really happy that Richard said to model data stuff because this slide was already written. Um, so we want to start by modeling our primary concepts in data. So when we think of animation, the first thing we probably want to anim or model in our uh, model is uh, a timeline. So this is going to be our, our first tool in our kind of animator's toolbox. So instead of worrying about how we're going to animate stuff, we're just going to look at modeling these primary concepts and then sort of where, where does that lead us? So great, we have a timeline. It's a list of events that happen at a certain time. That wasn't too hard. Um, well, uh, you know, we could make this a little nicer, though. I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't be too crazy to say, well, uh, could, could we make it non-empty? And yeah, we could, you know? So we know whenever we have a timeline, at the very least, we have 
in an initial state. That's just required. It's like, okay, well, that, that feels kind of good. I know more about just a timeline. Now we have this thing, we've been tracking these events as just a tuple of events and time, but the original you know, motivation for uh, Elm style animation was to make things interruptible, right? Well, that doesn't quite work, because you know, I was going to event, and then I wanted to go to the other event. So this doesn't work, this breaks down. Well, well, we need to graduate to union types. And we can kind of just model exactly sort of what we're thinking. So we, we still want, yeah, oh, okay, we were going to this event, or this event occurs at this time, rather. And we just want this additional constructor of, you know, we were scheduled to go to the birthday, but we got interrupted at this time to instead go to an L meetup at this time. Great. So. This feels pretty good, and it, it wasn't too hard to kind of get here. We haven't done anything kind of crazy. Uh, we just kind of like thought about timelines as a primary concept. It's like, well, but that's, that's not animation, right? So what, what do we need? Oh, this is my overview. So for example, like when you're actually modeling a timeline, um, here's like a timeline of Boolean which you would actually like capture in your model. And actually in your update statement, if you want to you know, s kick off a new series of events, you just say, you know, please schedule this event. So this is a timeline of Booleans. We probably want something more descriptive later on, but uh, in this case we say like, okay, uh, in two seconds uh, there will be an event true. And we can schedule any number of these. We could, we could make it flip back and forth, true, false, you know, what have you. But now we want some way to trans translate a timeline into HTML or something else that's renderable, right? Uh, so, well, you know, if we want to translate a timeline to something renderable, uh, that sounds like something we should do in our view, just by the nature of it. So, in our view, we're going to take our timeline. And we're basically going to wrap it sort of in this constructor where we basically say, we're going to be animating alpha, an alpha channel. We're going to take the timeline, we're going to take the current time, and we're going to map what the events mean uh, in terms of that property. So in this case, true, we're going to say, you know, is like full opacity, right? And false is like, you know, go away. It's, it's invisible. It's like, okay, well, that's, that's kind of cool. Now, if I had one slide that sort of like summarizes the API that I've been really thinking about, it, it's this one, and I kind of want to take a few moments. So we're storing a timeline. It can be a timeline of anything. We do have to have some sort of subscription to, time, uh, to the time. And in this case, we're going to use animation frames. Um, and in the view, we, wanna, we map it to the actual value. Now, why is this nice? Um, well, we have a primary concept of a timeline. So moving back and forth on a timeline, yeah, we could do that, right? You just have all the times, and you just say, I'm at a different time. Cool. We could animate any number of elements and properties against one timeline. That's cool. In Elm style animation, I had to, if I wanted to animate 10 things, I would have to have 10 things in my model. Now I have to have one. Not only that, but there was something that was bugging me with uh, Elm style animation, and it took like a year of me not thinking about it, and then it just sort of showed up, was that why, was, why were all my colors and all my paddings and all my values being declared in my update statement not, and being stored in my model? Like, that's not, that's not really an issue. Like, we can do that. That's fine. But at the same time, it's really nice. That seems like a view concern. It seems like that should be something we are, we are transforming a high-level state into, not necessarily that we're like, tracking the itty-bitty details of. So what does our next tool look like? Well, we are able to animate opacity, but what about like, other properties? Um, and that's what our toolbox is going to be. It's going to be, let's look at interpolations and how they can be nuanced. And, Understanding that an interpolation depends heavily on what you're actually interpolating. Color is going to be different than position. It's going to be different than rotation. And we probably want a unique strategy for each one. So in taking another quote from 
Richard, thank you. Um, making impossible states impossible. In this case, I've sort of been reframing it. This is a, like, it's the same concept, right? But uh, as like limiting sad space. In interpolation, there are a lot of like just subtly not quite right spaces. And what we want to do is lock on to, okay, what's the nice way to do this? Is, is there only one way, nice way to do this? That, well, we could just do it that way um, and figure it out. So what does this look like? Well, color cares about luminosity. Um, humans kind of perceive, like, they give a lot of weight to, to luminosity, right? So if we're going to pick, we need to pick a color space, and it's going to matter what color space we're actually going to animate through. So the first one is standard RGB, which you're probably used to because that's what RGB means, right? And uh, the problem here, and it may not be entirely obvious, but when the other uh, gradients show up, it might be, might be more obvious, is that the middle is actually pretty swampy. And this... Doesn't, this was hard to pick up. In Elm style animation, we use just standard RGB. And I remember animating the Elm logo and just being like, oh, I got colors moving and everything. Um, and then, but I'm like, but I, but I like feel bad in the middle. And, and I don't know why. You know, it was just like, okay, we're just, and it was because we're going through kind of this like swampy color. It's like, okay, well, cool. Well, I know RGB. And I know HSL, maybe the HSL. And it's like, OK, well, that's a problem because we're bright and turquoise, apparently. Um, so what can we do? So a nice solution to this is just something called linear RGB. So linear RGB, you're taking two values, and you're actually just, I believe you're squaring them, uh, adding them, and then square rooting them. Um, sometimes I get that inverted. Um, and what we're doing is you can kind of see the luminosities pretty consistent. You can see actually how swampy <laughs> the a standard RGB gets and how bright HSL gets. So we should just do that, right? So when we say animate like a background color, um, it should just be linear RGB and you shouldn't have to worry about it. So position cares about natural motion. Now, obviously, this is the thing that uh, was taking a lot of the spotlight for Elm style animation. Um, I was like, springs, we got to animate with springs. And springs are really cool. I'm not, I'm not like uh, <laughs> uh, saying that they're bad, but uh, this is really what I was caring about. We want some sort of concept of natural motion. Well, what does that mean? Well, first, and I wanted to show this just because, again, it's this concept, like this is the API, right? We just, we just map it to other stuff. Um, so now we have a new position, but how do we get natural motion? I mean, um, do we just go straight? That seems kind of not great. Uh, so what I kind of discovered um, is using uh, Hermite or Hermite curves. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce it. Um, so what Hermite curves, they're actually, uh, I believe they're a Bezier curve or related or some such. They may even be the exact same thing. It's just we're going to talk about them differently. So what a Hermite curve is, is instead of with a Bezier curve, you're actually specifying control points and two positions. Instead, we're going to specify positions and the derivative. It's like, okay, well, this is cool because what we really want for natural motion is we want like the velocity to be continuous, right? Okay. So we can actually see like here the you know event one, event two. Here we're just setting the velocity at zero. And you know, that's position in time, and that's great. Um, but we can chain these together. That's cool. Now it means that at every event, uh, we know that we're going to be continuous with our velocity. And now this, is, this specific slide is a little weird because we have uh, all the velocities are set to zero. So basically, we're going to start out at event one, we're going to go to event two, and we're going to like stop. And then we're going to go somewhere else, and then we're going to stop. And then we're going to go somewhere else, and we're going to stop. And that may be what you want, but maybe not. So we need to be able to tweak this. So the first thing that we could be able to do is, well, it would be easy enough just to adjust the starting velocity. I mean, this math is already here, right? Uh, and this becomes very important for actually deciding, um, like for, for managing the feel of an animation. But we still have kind of like this bumpy slip and slide going down. And it's not hard to basically just come up with a heuristic that calculates what a nice velocity would be at this time, and to just put that in there. Um, and the, the point kind of with this slide is not that I have a perfect solution. It's that 
it's flexible. There's a lot of different options that we can put in here depending on what sort of feel we want to go for. And smooth interruptions without springs. Though, we still haven't modeled elasticity. Now, uh, so this is like, we were using springs for smooth animations before, but we still may want some like wibbliness when uh, we're actually animating stuff. Now, I don't have a solution at the moment, but the only constraints are that we're at a like, specific position at a specific time. And you have a lot of information. In the extreme case, you have kind of the entire history of your element, right? Now, you probably we're going to have some uh, like heuristic on how to chop off some events so that we're not like bringing that along with us. But there's got to be enough information to do something that feels really nice here. So rotation. Again, we're, we're talking about uh, natural animation, right? But there's kind of a different thing that shows up. And that's this API. You're not necessarily always uh, talking about direct points that you want to stay at, right? So what we can also do is we can actually just describe constraints that we want at a certain time. So in this case, for animation, we can actually say, well, you know, when this event is off, go clockwise from wherever you were to this turn. And if it's on, I just want you to spin. I don't care about the position. So let's build a simple loader, huh? So a simple loader, we, we want, well, like, what are our states, right? It's like, well, we get to use the union type, and that's exciting. So we have a resting state, we have a loading state, and we have a loaded state. And we pop that in a timeline, and we're actually animating it. We just map it to what values we want on the elements that we actually want. We know that loading cares about like rotating at a certain speed, and otherwise just you know go back to normal. And uh, for our, we're gonna have like a little check mark that shows up, uh, and it should only show up when it's loaded. Um, and that's a GIF recording of the thing. Feels nice. We didn't have to do a whole lot. Now, that's just two elements, but um, it'd be nice if we could do more. But I wanted to take a, a slight diversion that this uh, API could show up. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not correlated to HTML, right? So we can still do things like uh, shape morphing. Uh, yeah, you're moving. OK. Um, or we can even have draw states. Now, so this one I haven't implemented as well. but. Essentially, we're not relying on any sort of weird quirk of SVG to actually do this stuff. Because we're doing all the math outside of the platform, like drawing what the curve should be, it's, it's not hard. We just draw the curve that we want, and then we render that. So we should do the other example that's not in the slides. So this was something I mocked up this morning. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to have time to do it, but I'm like, uh, I'll give it a try. So I've been working on a project that, uh, to visualize uh, guitar music. And uh, I was like, OK, well, can we do a little bit of an animation um, that's just based on one timeline, but animating multiple things? And we're going to kind of do a, uh, what is it, A minor pentatonic, like just scale. And now we're kind of doing two things here, which is kind of cool. We're both saying that a thing should pop up at a certain event, but we're also inspecting the timeline and saying, you know, after we're the event, can we be like half opacity so that we have like some knowledge of where we were? That's cool. Uh, I need slides again. OK, so animating lists. This is one that comes up a lot. And when I'm talking about animating lists, I'm not talking about uh, like animating a list of things. I'm actually talking about animating in the case of deleting and inserting stuff, because that's a case that comes up very commonly uh, and is a pain. And the reason it's a pain is when we delete an item, it's gone. So as soon as we delete it from our thing, we now uh, can't do anything with it, because it's not there. That's a problem. So sad face. So what, what, how do we need to think about this? Or what's one way to think about this, rather? Uh, one is we kind of want to maintain two sets of truth. 
We want ground truth, the thing that we actually care about, the data we care about, and we, we want some notion of animated truth. So what does that look like in this API? Well, it means we have an item, and we just kind of attach a timeline to it. OK. So if we have uh, a unique timeline, we just call it presence. We say, like, added, present, and deleted. Um, and we create a new type alias, because that feels good. Could be a full type, but for the moment, it's not. And then, after we've done our fancy animations that kind of can be any property that we sort of decide that makes sense, we just run this function every now and then. And it doesn't really matter when we run this function, because it's just going to rem like physically remove, <laughs> physically, it's going to like actually remove the thing from the list, right? It's only going to remove the things that are like flagged as they're resting at deleted. So they have gotten to the event deleted, and they're just hanging out there. You would probably need to write another function which actually is able to map uh, uh, over uh, things. Like if you want to actually operate over the list, you probably want to ignore deleted stuff. So, but this is the basic like uh, approach. So where did we end up? Uh, my animation did not work here. So timeline is an interface um, was my last point, but now it's my first. Um, one timeline to many elements or many properties. Things are interruptible. We have high-level keyframes because we just have, we have an even higher-level concept. We have the concept of a timeline, and we can have any number of things going towards that. It's easy to ta time travel because we have this primary concept of a timeline. And where will this idea, these ideas sort of show up? Uh, and I, I've done a lot of prototyping code, um, but nothing's actually, like I'm in step maybe three of Brian's uh, awesome step of, uh, steps of uh, progression of a package. Um, I'm thinking that this could be an interface for the animation for style elements. And why that's interesting is because we may have the opportunity to dynamically generate CSS animations from a timeline and the values it wants to be. And that's pretty awesome. Um, it means we can skip virtual DOM diffs, um, so performance just kind of shoots up. Uh, but it's also controlled by Elm's resiliency, right? So we don't have to worry about, OK, something happened. Now, the only reason why I'm saying that this might make sense for style elements is, one, we need to generate the CSS. We need to attach to the class. But we also need to give some consideration to, is the node going to be recycled? Because if it gets replaced, then your animation is just going to start over. Uh, so I don't really want to say in the documentation, like, hey, you should use keyed on anything you animate. I'd rather just do it for you, and it wouldn't be a problem. There could be a chance for this to be something like an inline am uh, animator, something along the lines of am uh, Elm style animation, um, but using kind of these concepts. Um, Obviously, I haven't made it yet, so I'm not sure if all the concepts directly translate. There are a few kind of weird areas um, that I'm interested to talk about uh, after the talk, but um, yeah. So what I want to le leave you with is sort of three kind of bigger takeaways. Um, one, primary concepts and data. It, at the very least, it's, it's fascinating to model a domain, to really see kind of what is possible and what's interesting. Um, Take a journey to nice defaults and reduce sad space. Uh, usually this means getting into the domain knowledge of stuff. With animation, when I originally wrote Elm style animation, I knew some of the defaults, but I actually didn't go maybe far enough to find all of the nice defaults. And be wary of inherited design choices. The original Elm style animation, I'm like, well, we, we kind of have to do it this way because we have to have springs. And that, that just started the whole thing. And that's, that's how I started the package, right? Um, and just be wary of it. It doesn't mean that it's bad. You could inherit a great design. And I hope you're excited about animation. Um, and also, thank you to Ian McKenzie for Elm Geometry, which helped me prototype a lot of this stuff. And Teresa's line charts, when you don't know why an animation is doing a thing, having a graphical representation of what's happening is great. Um, and the Elm NYC meetup, you guys are always awesome. And that's me. Thank you so much.